Hello everybody, welcome to The Gun Show with me and Chris Hamill, my guy. It's early guys, so be kind to us. Uh, we're going to do our best to have a little chat about Scotland and uh, why. Uh, who better to, to do it than two people without a Scottish accent who claim mm. that they are Scottish. Is that right? There you? is no winners here. There is no winners. Yes, the comments Scottish section. viewers yeah, are going to be in the comments straight away slaughtering us and, you know, look, this... Me looking like this it, for time eternal on YouTube, not going to age well. Yeah. It's like a machine gun effect. It's that, you know, if, if I throw enough stuff at you, maybe you'll just leave it. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll find out. Let us know in the comments what you think about uh, our preview about Scotland. But I wanted to get Chris on because you've done some uh, just brilliant uh, videos recently on, on Celtic. I know you're obviously a big Celtic fan. And so I, I thought it'd be great to, to have a chat with you about the squad and the setup and the fact that uh, Scotland are playing in a major tournament for, for the first time since 1998. Now, I'm old. So I that was the first tournament I remember, mm. 1998, like properly. So I remember that those games and that tournament and, um, you know, the inevitable heartbreak at the end of it. Um, but for you, Chris, is this... You're a little bit younger. Is this this is the first one? Is it for you? For I think for so many fans, like for Scottish fans, it's the first mm. time that they're at a major tournament. Yeah. How does that feel? Well, firstly, I want to explain a couple of things. One, the vest. You know, <laughs> been up since six fifty editing a video that needs to go out tomorrow, and I refused to you know make my appearance acceptable because mm. that would have eaten into my editing time. And then I forgot that I'd, of course, uh, committed to this. But I'm very glad you pulled me away from Premier Pro for 20, 20 30 minutes because I was going out of my mind. Uh, and secondly, what is that hammer just casually hanging behind your head? <laughs> uh, this is a very, very long story. Uh, it's a, it's back in the old football manager days. Someone said I did it, had a gif and said it was like some bloke just whacking stuff with a hammer. And this is James playing football manager. And then I nice. won. And then I went to the knockouts and I tactical nous kicked in and I won the games and I sort of went mad with this hammer so then I just stuck it there and now people get angry if it's not there so that's that's why it's there you've truncated that story very well thank you yeah um yes this is my first sort of recollection um of Scotland that a major tournament I, I've just been used to you know the constant disappointment or albeit you know by proxy you know I, I felt the disappointment secondhand from my fam family in Scotland um but yeah they've been as, as in my sort of adulthood, uh, a constant joke. There's been some highlights, obviously Jane, James McFadden, you know, uh, scoring at the part of the Prance, that that victory. I think they beat Ho uh, France home and away. That yeah, year. yeah, yeah. That was a very memorable campaign. There's, there's been, a, yeah, there's been a few nearlies, hasn't there? There's been a few almosts. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great to see them get over the line, albeit through the back door uh, this time around. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get into this. Because I, yes. I looked at, I've, like, so I'm not going to give my prediction on Scotland because I've done that in a separate video. But at the end of this, I want to hear your prediction on what you think can can happen to them. But maybe, mm. maybe I'm being biased. But I think Steve Clark's done a, I mean, he's done a wonderful job. Of course, he's got yes. them. Like when he picked up the job, it was off the back of the, I think it was the three 0 defeat to Kazakhstan. Yeah, not great. After that, they won his first game against Cyprus, and then after that, lost four on the bounce, at conceding thirteen, scoring one. It was mm. not a good time. But since then, and I'm, oh, I'm uh, the big reason I wanted you on, Chris, to kind of talk about the formations and the, uh, uh, how they're going to set up. I really like the options that that this team has, um, mm. and we'll get into that. But let's let's first of all, Steve Clark did a fantastic job. Do you think there's a, any element, and this is maybe me just playing devil's advocate for a second? that the fact that, you know, there is this different route into a major tournament means that he's not any better than any of these previous guys? Or do you set him apart from, you know, the guys that have been before, you know, the Strakens and... Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Makes... And it is, yeah, you're right. The Nations League makes it slightly more forgiving. But there is also a different side to that. The Like the UEFA Nations League has cost a fair few managers their job on the cusp of the tournament. Mm. So it has made, I think, international football a little less chill in that sense because there are no meaningless or less meaningless games, yeah. right? Officially, so, officially meaningless. Yeah, it could have gone the other way for him um, quite easily. And you're right, he inherited a very porous side with a very sort of, I don't want to say defeatist mentality, um, I think, but I think just it decide... kind of was that it was like, or it was like acceptant. 
I think that mm. was it. It was accepting of like things will probably go wrong. Yeah. Right? It had become habitual that when they conceded one or two goals, it would normally lead to a hiding. Um, and the sort of games against Russia and Belgium uh, recently quite reminiscent of that. Um, but I think he's done, White Clark has done really well, is um, maximised the the ability within the squad. And, you know, I think that's probably why they the SFA gave him the job in the first place because he demonstrated that he could do that on a consistent basis with Kilmarnock, right? Uh, Kilmarnock punching well above their weight under him uh, in, a, in a domestic sense. Uh, and I think they wanted that to translate to interna international level. And it did, not straight away, got off to a slow start. I mean, you talk about that victory over Cyprus, it it required a sort of a goal in the dying embers of the game. I think it was from Ollie Burke, um, if I remember correctly. Because I specifically remember after that thinking, great, <laughs> more of the same. Yes, yeah, new new regime, same shit. Um, but yeah, he, he soon went to that to that back three. You know, uh, we saw some unorthodox players in that back three. Uh, Scott McTominay, normally plays central midfield, of course, as a right centre back. We yeah. had Kieran T, who's a marauding left back, like at, at left centre back, playing next to Robertson, which solved one of the dilemmas of how do we get both of these players in the team, Robertson and Tierney. Um, and it's worked really well. And I think probably a bit more fluid within that system than people give them credit for. Um, and of course, he got, what was it? 5-3-2 or 3-4-3. Three, three. He started to play a little bit with, with two forwards. We saw that against the Netherlands. Um, although right, it's normally Ryan Christie playing off a striker. Um, but if things go well, we might see two strikers utilised up there and it become a, even more expansive. But I suppose we'll, we'll elaborate on that moving forward. Well, yeah, let's, I tell you, we can go, we can go there. Let, we can do that. Uh, the final thing I would say on Steve Clarks, I think the difference between him and some of the other guys is, I think a lot of those other guys were kind of underdogs, underdog managers almost. You know, like mm. uh, Bit, Bit Strachan or, or Burley or those kind of McLeish, like that. Those kind of managers who like are used to like right guys, let's dig in, and, and I think they thought that might be the way. With Steve Clark, the way he managed, you know, teams in England like West Brom. And also his time with Chelsea, I think, as well. I think that's the thing. It's kind of teamed up with, OK, he's got some good players here. And so maybe let's be that little bit more adventurous. And yes, we'll play players not in the exact position that they want to play, but understand that these are elite footballers. And so if they can buy into it, mm -hmm. I can find a way to kind of make them fit, which moves us on perfectly to to the way that they've set up. And I've looked at... The, the sort of lineups, I guess, during that, that run and getting us to, to, the, um, to the Euros. And the, the McTominay thing is, I find the McTominay thing, I, it works for me. It really, really works for me. But I wonder if it's something that, is it something that he wants to do? It's probably not something he wants to do long term. But again, it's a bit like the cramming of Robertson and Kieran Tierney, which has worked. So a lot of people, if, if they've not seen Scotland play... Scott McTominay would play on the, kind of the right side of it, but it, because we're on such an angle with the way that we play. And so Robertson, if you look at the World Cup qualifiers, I was looking at the touches he's had. 96 touches is, was his average. So he's like, they're going down that left hand side as much as possible, trying to get him involved. And so when you're on, when it's a bit squiff, for want of a better word, there's kind of that space for McTominay to, yes, be there when when Scotland haven't got the ball as a back three, but also kind of be a bit braver and step forward mm. with the with the ball. That said, I think the one thing that we're certain of with the Scottish lineup, because I, the, so I'm looking at the in front of me now, the Faroe Islands game, the Israel game, and the Austria game, which are the three World Cup qualifiers. In all of them, there's a back three. In all of them, you've got Grant Hanley as the, the middle of that back three. Um, uh, in all of them, you've got Kieran Tierney on the left-hand side. But you've got Scott McTominay and then Jack Hendry playing in two of the games. And then further mm. forward, that's where it, we'll get to that in a second. But the, the idea of do you play one up top, do you play two up top, is, is these are huge, huge calls for Steve Clark to, to play. Because if he gets it spot on in these huge, tough games, they have got a chance because they do have personnel. And I do think they've got real dynamism, actually. That's the thing that I'm really excited about this Scottish team is that I think often I've been like... I've, I've watched us and I'm like, God, we look little. <laughs> like, God, we look little, but we've got a couple of lanky boys at the back. And like, we're just sort of huffing and puffing. We've you know, got Kenny Miller working his nuts off up top. Like, it's, we've not had that same kind of, yeah, dynamism, energy, ability to get around the pitch, ability to kind of force mistakes with be it pressing or that, you know, the, and be able to counterattack as well. All these things. 
So with Scott McTominay as a player who can stamp his authority on a game, what do you think about him? Do you would, would you still play him on that as that right sided centre back to? Because hmm. we have got other options in midfield. Or do you feel like we need to try and get him a little bit further forward? It's it's tough because I like Scott McTominay as a midfielder. Like his range of passing is really solid. He's obviously very mobile. She shields the back three very well, uh, very adeptly. But I can see why Steve Clark would persevere because Scotland's strength uh, in terms of their quality, it, you know, it's probably at its strongest in central midfield, despite Kenny McLean despite um, Jack Ryan uh, dropping out as well through injury, who obviously uh, featured quite prominently in his stewardship. Um, Hendry's had a really good season at Oostend, so much so that I think they want to make it permanent. And they were really punching above their weight in the Jupiler Pro as well. I think they they just about fell short uh, in trying to secure a position in the playoffs um, at the very end of the season. So... He's been a bit of a revelation there. He needed the minutes because at Celtic, he wasn't getting the minutes. He, he, he was looking nowhere near international calibre, by the by. Mm. Uh, but then pops up and has a great game against the Netherlands. It uh, bags a yeah, great terrific goal. goal. Yeah. Uh, and that's pretty indicative of actually how, like, I think this this setup is much more attacking than people give it credit for. Kieran Tierney, the top assister in World Cup qualifiers, he's playing on the left uh, left hand side of of the centre half, obviously, like you referenced there, it's either yeah. Grant Hanley, it's it's Cooper, it's um, maybe not Declan Gallagher, um, and yeah, I think he's he's averaging more key passes per game than Robertson, which is quite revealing. I think mm. Robertson's very good dragging the play away, letting Tierney run into that space, and we've got sort of a underlapping centre half situation that we saw sometimes uh you know Sheffield United utilize uh, to great effect last season. Yeah. So but there's with, a little but bit with of two that... players that are like you know yeah. elite 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 footballers. Which yeah is exciting, for sure. Right? There's a little bit of that going on as well. And, mm. and when you watch like Stephen O'Donnell at right back, he's a pressing monster. Um that the goal against Serbia, Ryan Christie's goal against Serbia pretty much came about because he was pressing hard, game. harrying. Yeah. Yeah, um, but then you also look at that that right back slot, and at times he's utilised Fraser, he's utilised Forrest. That is a very attacking mm. uh, decision, uh, especially when you know you're you're allowing your set of halves to, to to go forward as well. So there's a little bit more tactical fluidity there than than kind of than shoring up this poorer Scottish defence by lumping five guys there. Yeah. So I think he deserves credit for that. And um, but I think. That works largely owing to the intelligence of the midfield as well. You've got McGregor, who can drop off. He's played in a double pivot for Celtic uh, for a number of years with Scott Brown. Um, Turnbull probably isn't used to, to the defensive side of the game and might be a little bit naive there still. Doesn't do a lot of defensive work for Celtic, but is wonderful at creating chances at, uh, at set pieces. And you've got Stuart Armstrong, um, Who's, who's an absolute workhorse, I think an underrated carrier of the ball. Again, a good, a good reader of the game. And I mean, last but not least, John McGinn, who's actually approaching sort of elite status. Yeah, uh, and he's I was become amazed a clutch by his player. Numbers. I was amazed Scotland. by his yeah. numbers in the Euros. I think he scored seven goals in the Euro qualifier. Yeah, he's, he's got 10 in like 36 yeah. for Scotland. And he didn't score for his first like at least half a dozen games. It's yeah. crazy. It's, uh, and with him, I kind of... I was looking at uh, Win Aldum and like his role for for the Dutch, and, and mm. there are some of those players that you know. Okay, for their club side, they've got to be a bit more, I don't know, conservative, or it's you know, it's a bit more about the defensive side yeah. of the ball. But again, these aren't players. Who, you know, it's not just um, that's all they can do. And John McGinn's a good example of that. We haven't even spoken about Billy Gilmore as well. I think you're mm. you're so right with the. Uh, with the, the squad and the fact that it is so much more attacking than you think, because actually, so that we're, we're going to play for at the back. We're going to play four slash five, um, and then we're going to play either one or two up top, or it'd be like a two one. Um, but all those kind of replace some of the some of the replacements and changes. When I look at the team, I feel like especially against teams where you're going to be the underdog, I feel like there's a team to kind of start a game to kind of maybe it will be sitting deep to a point. But it also, like I say, has so much energy in midfield and great runners going forward as well. And against the in the really tough games, I've seen, uh, let's say, Austria, for example, Ryan Christie and Stuart Armstrong playing as like a two. And if you look at the average positions of those that game, when they played with Shea Adams, it was all quite spread out. But I think they were playing the Faroe Islands in that game. So, that you know, they're going to dominate the game. Mm. In these tougher games, they used Lyndon Dykes as this, you know, as this hold up man. 
And then the, the two guys were really, really close to him, playing really, really narrow. And the width came from the, the, the fullbacks, Andrew Robertson getting forward uh, and Stephen Donnell. And so what that does, which I think is interesting, is that it, it allows these teams to, sorry, it allows Scotland to counter-attack. But in terms of protecting stuff, you've got two more players in the middle of the pitch and, you know, the rest of the guys can kind of work back and you've already got three centre-backs there as well. So the kind of the defensive insurance... Mm. is is there and then going forward for a team that might not and maybe i'm being unfair in this might not i mean certainly if you've just got Lyndon dykes up front on his own is not gonna um he's gonna hold up the ball brilliantly i've seen that for the first time with qpr but it's one guy up front on his own it's yeah. not two guys making the runners what you've got is a, a team full of those runners those third man fourth man whatever you want to call it runners and so that's where uh, this scotland team i think if they can Use that energy, you know, win the ball in, like you said, with Stephen O'Donnell was doing that um, in that game um, where Ryan Christie got his goal. I think that's where the, the excitement comes for me. But then when you say it's not going well, mm. Che Adams comes on, you can play two up top. You know, Ryan Fraser could, could come on and you can play a bit wider. Um, Billy Gilmore as well. That's what I was going to say as a midfielder as well. He's like an att- I feel like Billy Gilmore will be almost like an attacking substitute for, for a team like Scotland. Because if they are going to play two there, it, it will become a team that has a lot of, this sounds like a negative thing, but hustle. You're kind mm. of swapping that in for that that ball player who's probably not got the exact same same energy. So there's, there's there are real, real options there. I think it's like, that's the thing I'm, I'm so chuffed with, is the fact that I think if you, normally you had, right, okay, this is our, this is our first 11. It's okay. Hopefully we can maybe get some stuff from set pieces. There wasn't a depth like there's there's real maybe not down to the like the dying embers of the squad but the first like 16 17 is really really strong really really strong mm. yeah i i really like the lineup uh and i like the way he's utilizing the talent and i like that he's entrusting um people that have shined uh on a domestic front as well we've seen kevin nisbet uh, come into the the fray after a great season with Hibs, where he's averaged, I think, a goal every other start. And you've got Lyndon Dykes, who was, um, you know, kicking it about uh, at Livingston, was it, a couple mm. years ago? Yep. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's great to see these guys get their chance and take their chance at, at a very high level. It speaks well of the improvements in the Scottish game as well. And Lyndon Dykes, I mean, you'll have to give me a bit more insight QPR-wise, but he seemed to finish the season very strongly after taking a little bit of time to adapt. And yeah, his hold at play at international level has been incredible. <laughs> and I'm not sure the system works as well without him. And I think that Clark may be wary of that. And that's why we're starting to see a bit more of a 3-5-2 rather than like, can Ryan Christie, can, you know, can Lyndon Dykes pop it down to Ryan Christie and Ryan Christie have a, an, an effort from 25 yards, which is his speciality, mm. by the way. Like most of his shots for Celtic come outside the box. He is a little bit frustrating at times, but a lot more energy, like a, a, um, a lot of sort of tackles and interceptions as well that maybe some Celtic fans don't give him credit for. Decent on set pieces. Like he offers a lot, but I think if if Scotland are dominating a game or want to close out a game, um, yeah, maybe taking him off and, and being and gambling a little bit more with a, with another forward mm. like Che Adams. Well, that was, that was going to be my next question was, if you've got Che Adams and you've you've obviously brought him in, you know, in the last mm. last set of games before this, he, has he got to play? Is it a waste if you don't start him? Because so to, to give you a bit more context of that, um, with Lyndon Dykes, actually. So the reason he did so well was he was playing up front on his own. And yes, his hold up play was good, but he it was all on him. It was too much pressure and he and he couldn't. He was struggling to score goals in that way. And also he was kind of working too hard. So he was kind of like, yeah, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it, I'll get it. And then there's no one in the box. And so no yeah. goals were coming. Um, Charlie Austin came in, who is, you know, that penalty box poacher, especially in the championship. And they played together. And, and Charlie Austin just said, that, like, he was saying to him, stop running so much. Stay yeah. between the, the, you know, inside the penalty box, the width of that. And those two as a pair worked brilliantly because you mm. know Lyndon Dykes will win the ball. His 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 sort of one touch passing from his hold up play is is wonderful, and mm. and Charlie Austin you know reaped the rewards and like you say it kind of then come back round where he he got one he got a tap in at uh, Reading away, and then he was off and he was running again and and thank goodness for Scotland because 
he was really struggling prior to that. So that's the, that's the then the question is, can you play up? Can you play two up top against, you know, moving forward into talking about the group? Can you play mm. two up top? And would you play two up top? Um, I think like Christie would be the the victim there if Adams was to play with with Lyndon Dykes, right? Um, and this bit, you know, impact sub. Um, just thinking of how the the midfield dynamic may change behind that. You might see a slightly more conservative midfield, right? Because it was great to see Turnbull get a run out against the Netherlands, but he he might be down that right hand side if you're playing him with someone like Forrest or uh, like Ryan Fraser. That right hand side all of a sudden looks a little bit. Uh, weak on mm. defensive output so that is definitely something something to think about and I think that's probably where Ryan Jack and Kenny McLean will be missed because they are willing just to sit that lets McGinn be a little bit more expansive like you said he's much more attacking for Scotland than he is for for Aston Villa um, where you know he's never you never really see him in the 10 space do you yeah um, there's one brave call isn't there there's there's one brave call that needs, needs to be made be it mm-hmm. in the back three and you don't play McTominay there and you move him into midfield or or you play one and, and later on if you play one yeah. up top or not I think those are the he two he might do that you know it might we might see Hendry drop out I mean could... You might, yeah, you might see one of Hendry or Cooper drop out. Um, just referencing that Netherlands squad now. McTominay push forward. I, it, Grant Hanley come back in. Um, but I actually am. I remain positive. I remain buoyant about their chances in the group. I don't. Think, I mean, this this Croatia side has aged. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. You know, their run to the final was great. It was fairy tale stuff. Uh, Luka Modric, sort of, uh, he deserved it, didn't he? And, but, but. You know, after after that tournament, I remember their manager saying to to the Croatian media, "I'm like the second best manager in the world," and I'm not sure it was that tongue in cheek, to be perfectly honest. And and that statement has aged like milk since. They had a rancid UEFA <laughs> Nations tournament. Like they are not the same team they were going into this. Scotland beat the Czech Republic what three times th- this year slash last year. Uh, albeit, you know, I think the Czechs in one of those fixtures had a really like COVID ravaged squad, mm-hmm. and it was still pretty close. Um, so yeah, I think they're going to be competitive in every single game. Yeah. Um, and that isn't something like I, I envisage saying, <laughs> you know, pr- 12 months prior, like yeah. I can, I can see them, co- I can see them finishing second. Like it's not just me being optimistic or, or, you know, looking at it through rose tinted goggles, like objectively I can see them challenging for second. Do you know what? The, the first game is it for both. Well, for every team, sorry. Checks it's, as well. Oh, it's huge, mate. Because you've got England, England, Croatia. You know, two teams that are expect you know expected to be first and second. But you know, and for for Scotland and the Czech Republic, they will both be looking at each other and going, "This is the one we have, we have to win, really, or certainly, certainly, certainly not lose." And if Scotland can win that first game, and say say England don't win their first game, so that's a draw. That Chaos. second game. <laughs> That second yeah. game is like a different world from what you w- would think it would be when you look at the FIFA rankings of, of Scotland and England. It becomes a mass, like it becomes a real problem because say Scotland win that game, Croatia win the England game. You go into that game where if Scotland win it, of course it's at Wembley, which is going to be difficult. But if Scotland win it, they're out. They put England out. Pre- well, or they make it very, very difficult for them. They might be able yeah. to get third place and get themselves over the line. But they need I that first Scottish game. Allegiance right? then. Doesn't doesn't shine through if that happens, does it, James? <laughs> I, I, mate, I, I so I went to Euro '96. I went to uh, England, Scotland, and my, so my dad is is you know my dad's English, like my mum's Scottish, so I'm kind of like confused with it all. But obviously, <laughs> when it comes to football, you know, England is England's there above it because it's been more prominent, right? And it's my connection with my dad. But my dad hurt his um, Achilles and so couldn't go to the game. So I had to go with my mum. To, to, oh, right. And I remember just thinking, and, and I remember also in 2000, I think we, we played them the other year, didn't we? Lee Griffith scored uh, that goal. And see there, I'm even saying that we played them. Like, it's the same country. Well, it's not the same country, you know what I mean. But yeah, I find it really weird because I can't be mm. pure. I can't be pure in my like both hatred and love. I find it really, really strange. Even though, like, of course, like my focus is England uh, generally, or the English league as well. I Give me really a weird. a brutal hierarchy of like um, your your loyalty. So I would go like Celtic winning the Champions League oh. above England winning the Euros, and then I would, and then I would go 
but obviously England beating Scotland all day. So that's why I'm so, sort of in like this confusing Scottish English sandwich, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. So yeah, I mean, uh, QPR winning a Champions League, I literally can't even imagine that. So yeah, yeah, yes, I'll take that. <laughs> um, then I think it's in... Then things, you no. Know, I mean, if Scotland... It's going to win the World Cup. It'd be mad, wouldn't it? That'd be amazing. But um, look, let's be honest. Like, it is England first, for sure. For sure. Because it just, it's too, in- that's so much more ingrained. Um, and, you know, it's the football that I'm, I'm used to. So, Scotland is beneath it. Um, but, yeah, it, like, I can't go, I, I chemically can't go, f- like, yeah, I can't go mental, which is a shame. Yeah. So I just don't but enjoy I do... these games. I just don't enjoy When them. Ryan Christie scored against Serbia, I was like doing laps around the living room and I was like, I was like, well, this is, it was, it was like a natural. It just like erupted out of me. So I yeah, think yeah. I'm a little bit more invested than I perhaps consciously realise in the Scottish national side uh, through years of sort of being uh, dug out by my Scottish cousins and stuff. They've like assimilated me. Slowly, yeah. But... Oh, I think that's it. So with my mum, it's like, it's, yes, she's, ta- yes, she puts it forward less, but she puts it forward more, passionately yeah. <laughs> whereas like generally being english you know unfortunately has connotations that aren't as aren't as um don't make you as proud so yeah. so that's it that's potent, the weird thing more potent doses yeah but, but, but less of them yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah. um right mate i'm gonna let you go because i know you've got a very very busy busy day mate so thank you mate I for have. spending a bit of time with it's lovely to chat to you hopefully we can have a pint soon That'd be good. yeah for sure yeah um, we'll go and watch uh go and watch a scotland game and you know we can we can We'll see. Gently celebrate. The, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, are we going to be doing video? Are we going to see any videos? It's got them videos. Don't want to put you under too much pressure. A lot of uh, Celtic fans have been asking for a video on Ange Poster Coglu, so I think that is that is next on my channel. But you, you've seen on my channel videos very few and far between because of like the football daily commitments, which is of course, you know, man. 18 videos a week over three channels so that's um, no, i think that's enough that that is enough yeah <laughs> that is enough um but apart from that no just just the just the Celtic stuff for now but i am really excited with the scottish uh scottish team and i am very happy that i got to talk about them this morning i'll tell you what, um, oh, sorry let me get your prediction very upbeat, give me your very prediction upbeat. what's your prediction i think england i i think england are gonna win the group convincingly and then i think it's like a four pointer could decide second place yeah I think that I, I I just that first game the 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 Czech Republic game it's just huge. Mm. I just think it's so important because if they then hit their stride, it could be it could be it could be mad. Because I've yeah. I mean my prediction video full predictions covered up. And so if it if it plays out the way I've put it out there, yeah, it could be a tasty summer for, for Scotland fans like for sure. Because there's also obviously the four best third placed sides go through, don't yeah. they? Yeah. So there's and, an outside chance that they sneak through that way as well. But yeah, and of like final teas for that for that video. What what's crazy is I, in the group stage, I bash a team, and then they go really far in the tournament <laughs> because the oh. draw works out for them. Yeah, because of like some like England's draw is actually sh- terrific, shocking, terrific. Whoever finishes second in our group, happy days. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. Like you don't want to win. Draw. You don't want to win that. Yeah. You don't really want to win it. You don't really want to mm. win that group, to be honest. Which I mean, Southgate's like managed beautifully previously but in 2018 yeah yeah anyway uh, i'll let you go mate thank you so so much uh guys go check out chris hamill on twitter and check out his youtube channel because when videos do come out they are well good promise you thank you mate promise appreciate you, that uh thanks for watching guys let us know what you think in the comments down below subscribe to the channel and i'll see you on the next one Ta-da.